Welcome to the news at four. Here's a live look from our Astoria Sky camera. Pretty gray out there today and rain is in the forecast well into the weekend. Joe Ranieri will have more on that coming up in 10 minutes. Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you so much for joining us on this Wednesday. And here's what's happening. A community removed from the Albina neighborhood wants the city of Portland to provide financial support. It's a request 50 years in the making. 63% of Portland businesses are reporting break-ins just in the past 18 months. Business owners are calling on police for more help. A new report comes with a warning for Portland's economy. Experts suggest local leaders need to act with urgency to help households and businesses stay afloat. The suspect who set off the chain of events leading to the death of Vancouver police officer Donald Sahota now faces murder charges. Galen Atlin has new information from court today. Galen. Yes, Brittany, the suspect Julio Segura is accused of robbing a convenience store, then running from police. A Clark County deputy going after Segura mistakenly shot and killed off-duty police officer Donald Sahota. And today, Segura was back in court on new murder charges for Sahota's death. These court documents, too, also show us more about what happened that night. Julio Cesar Segura of Yakima appeared in Clark County Court Wednesday, facing murder charges in the death of Vancouver police officer Donald Sahota. New documents from prosecutors say even though Sahota died from being shot by a deputy, Segura is responsible for the death. They also detail more about what happened. While running from deputies after a robbery, Segura ended up outside Sahota's home. Sahota had a gun and identified himself as an officer. He went outside to restrain Segura, but then Segura fought back with a knife. The defendant admitted that he stabbed Officer Sahota repeatedly. Documents say drone and airplane footage showed the two fighting, but were unidentifiable in the dark. Segura disarmed Officer Sahota and ran into the home. The defendant chases Officer Sahota's wife. And it's clearly while he's still armed with the knife. Sahota's wife was on the phone with 911 and told responders her husband was an officer with the gun. Then Deputy Jonathan Feller arrived. Officers in the air broadcasted that a figure on the ground picked up a gun and was headed toward the house. That unknown figure was Officer Sahota, seen trying to kick in his own front door to chase Segura. Deputy Feller saw that, then fired four shots in four seconds, killing Officer Sahota. Feller later told investigators he was convinced Sahota was the suspect trying to get into the house to hurt people. The medical examiner noted that even though Sahota died by gunshot, the stab wounds to his neck and lung from Segura would likely have killed him without immediate medical attention. Extraordinarily dangerous conduct by the defendant. Prosecutors say Segura's conduct demonstrated extreme indifference to human life, but his defense said murder charges go too far. We are now challenging the sufficiency of the information. The defense pushed to postpone arraignment until March to review the new charges and indicated intent for a not guilty plea. The judge denied a request to reduce Segura's $5 million bail. Uh, not a difficult for the court to determine that there is a significant risk to the community in this case. Now, a lot of this new information comes after investigators compiled and synced up videos and audio from the drone, airplane, Segura's own confession, and Mrs. Sahota's 911 call. Back to you. Thank you, Galen. Unjustified, unwarranted, and unnecessary. That's how the family of a man shot and killed by a Portland police officer describes their loved one's death. And now they're filing a lawsuit against the city of Portland. You might recall Michael Townsend was shot and killed in late June of last year. An attorney representing the Townsend family says the 40 year old was suffering from bipolar disorder and schizophrenia and called 911 for help. First responders rushed to a motel in the Lloyd district. And as you can see in the video, Townsend approached them. He had a sharp object in his hand. Townsend was shot and killed by officer Curtis Brown, who was cleared of any wrongdoing by a grand jury. The family has filed a lawsuit against the city of Portland, claiming police never should have responded. They believe mental health professionals should have instead. This case is not anti-police. It's not anti-cop. Um, it is pro change in policy so that these types of killings don't have to happen again. KGW reached out to Mayor Ted Wheeler and the Portland Police Bureau for a comment on the lawsuit. They both got back to us saying they do not comment on pending litigation.
A group of Portlanders is pushing the city to offer restitution after their families were displaced from the Albina neighborhood in Northeast Portland 50 years ago. Ashley Cordsland explains. They tired of not getting what they deserve. A renewed push for restitution from Portlanders. An unfulfilled promise. Like this woman who goes only by the name Bird. Well, this battle's been going on since it started, right? Since the 60s and 70s. I'm just, I'm just the latest iteration. Her grandparents were one of 171 families in the Albina neighborhood in Northeast Portland, whose homes were destroyed to make way for a hospital expansion project in the early 1970s. The majority of families displaced were African American. My grandmother's house and my granddaddy's tavern was just down there across the street. It was demolished and they were not compensated. It was part of Portland's Emanuel Hospital expansion, now known as Legacy Emanuel Medical Center. Using eminent domain, the city raised hundreds of homes and businesses, then sold 55 acres of land to the hospital in the name of urban renewal. The expansion never happened. EDPA2 is reclaiming what's ours. This week, BIRD's organization, Emanuel Displaced Persons Association 2, or EDPA2, hosted a virtual forum. It highlighted a new report from PSU Urban Planning graduate students. The report details the financial toll of the hospital expansion 50 years later. Every one of these lots, we have the data for what the home was assessed for originally. If this community had never been removed, uh, how much would their homes be worth today? The report concludes that the displaced families are owed $89 million when factoring in current fair market value and inflation. Now, Bird is pushing the city to offer restitution before it moves ahead with redevelopment plans at the corner of North Williams and Russell. Every home that was demolished. The very place Bird stood with supporters to call for accountability from city leaders. It's a vacant piece of land that was taken as part of the hospital expansion. Today, the city of Portland, Legacy Health, and Prosper Portland are working on plans to redevelop the 1.7 acres. Planners say the Williams and Russell project will honor Portland's African-American community and support housing and economic needs. In response to Byrd's demands for restitution, the mayor's office released this statement. The City of Portland, Legacy Health, and Prosper Portland have worked to engage with EDPA2 through a community-based process. It goes on to say that EDPA2 was an original member of the group working on the Williams and Russell project. Quote, until its representative chose to stop attending meetings more than two years ago. Now, Bird says that there were a number of reasons why sh uh, she and her group EDPA2 stopped working with the city and others on this project, including an emergency medical condition that she says she suffered. She also says that she felt people in her group were not being heard by the city and others working on the Williams um, development project. And I do want to point out that I pushed back to the mayor's office asking specifically about these demands for restitution and their comment on that. And so far, I have not heard back. Laurel. We'll see if we do hear from them. Thank you, Ashley. A new Portland restaurant has gone through four break-ins in three months, all before its grand opening. The restaurant's owner, Ezekiel Gutierrez, says thousands of dollars of tools and equipment were stolen. Surveillance cameras at Mikava and Cocina caught one of the suspects who broke into the restaurant. This was in late January. The cost of these break-ins is a big deal, but what bothers Gutierrez the most is the lack of support. He claims authorities aren't doing enough to find the thieves. But people have to do something about it. I mean, all the businesses, the people are losing their business, the livelihoods, the, all the work for the, the life's work. A business advocacy group called Bricks Need Mortar found that about two thirds of its small business clients have been broken into or vandalized over the past year and a half. The Portland Business Alliance released their 2022 State of the Economy report today. It looks at everything from the cost of living to tourism to employment. Maggie Vespa breaks down that report. We've assumed positive population growth. We've assumed jobs recoveries from previous recessions. Those assumptions 
are no longer valid. The lack of positive, given that it's sort of been an assumed positive in the past, yeah, sounds you see inherently that negative. One element of this report people should really pay attention to is what does it take to live in this region now? What is the income it takes? And for a family with two parents and two kids, 93,000 plus is what it takes to sustain life here. That is a very high income. Can I ask you about some of the stats? Um, jobs lost. Portland is down 3.2% overall from pre-pandemic levels versus places like Austin and Salt Lake City, who we compare ourselves with. They've actually gained jobs and are ahead of where they were pre-pandemic. For people who think, you know, oh, come on, this is just what happens in any major city. These are the problems that all, you know, most U.S. major cities have. And um, But Portland's such a cool city. You know, we've got like the things that everybody loves here that can't go away, like nature and access to, you know, different activities that people love. You can't really bring down Portland. Like, <laughs> it's not it's not that vulnerable. What, what would you say? No, we aren't Detroit post automaker departures and we're not New York City in the 70s and 80s. Uh, but we do have to act differently if we are to change the paradigm and start to think about embracing new policies that welcome and compete for households and for business. Maggie Vespa, KGW News.